Dr. Sanjay Kumar for inviting me to uh, give this talk. It's always a pleasure to be here and to share some thoughts uh, with the audience. Now when this topic was given to me, uh, it was a huge challenge because this is like summarizing the whole hepatology in 15 minutes because it covers everything. We know that all liver diseases can cause jaundice and how do I cover all the liver diseases in 15 minutes? And that's when I decided that I will just give a clinical approach and the basic principles as to what investigations do we ask for, how do we evaluate these patients and a very practical algorithm that is there in such patients. This is something which we have been learning from first MBBS, although I never understood the importance of this until I did my DM gastroenterology, the metabolism of bilirubin. We can divide into prehepatic, hepatic and post-hepatic causes for jaundice and this still holds true. The basic guiding principle is anything that is conjugated will come out in the urine if it is increasing the blood. If it is not conjugated, it won't come out in the urine. So even if you remember this much from this whole metabolism, as a clinician, your work is done. But of course, we like to complicate when things become too easy. And you know, otherwise, where is the value of the clinicians or specialists or super specialists? So we would love to complicate. And that's why today now, from that simple algorithm which we learned, learned in first year MBBS, we have now reached here, where we talk of all these transporters like the NTCP, the PACP, the MDR, the OATP, and how disorders of these can also cause jaundice and cholestasis. And today, Diagnosis of these disorders is also a reality. It is no longer a figment of imagination. It's not that you have to send the patient to Mayo Clinic to get a diagnosis. Today with simple basic tests, you can reach a diagnosis even for these. So let's start with the easiest. When a patient comes with jaundice, the first thing that we need to identify is unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And the causes could be either because of excessive bilirubin production, Classical example being hemolysis because of any acute insult. Classical example being G6PD. And this is something which is very underdiagnosed. You have a patient who drops his hemoglobin suddenly from 12 to 5, 12 to 4, 12 to 3, and the bilirubin jumps up to 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, is predominantly indirect. It is G6PD deficiency unless specified otherwise. You must send the G6PD sample in this patient before a transfusion is given. Because if you give transfusion, the G6PD of the transfused blood will make it appear to be normal and you will miss out on a G6PD deficiency. So please remember to collect the sample for G6PD before you transfuse the blood. So anybody coming with sudden drop in hemoglobin and sudden rise in indirect hyperbilirubinemia, G6PD is something which we should always be born in mind. And then the other causes we are all aware. Ineffective enteropoiesis. In post-operative patients, remember the reabsorption of hematoma. This is one of the commonest references that you get post-operatively. Patient is referred to you in the surgical ICU for a rise in bilirubin. If you have that, look for a hematoma somewhere and you can reassure the surgeon, reassure the patient and at least you become free that there is nothing medical in that. If at all there is a problem, it is surgical. And then transfusions and in general chronic hemolytic anemias can present the same way. And then you can have impaired conjugation. So we all are aware of the Gilbert syndrome and the Pickler Naja syndrome. But what we forget are drugs. And common drug, rifampicin. It can, we are all aware that it can cause cholesterol jaundice. But we don't remember that it can cause a rise in indirect bilirubin. And this rise in indirect bilirubin is of no clinical consequence. So you have a patient who is on rifampicin, the bilirubin is 3, the direct bilirubin is only 0 0.3, 0 0.4. You can reassure the patient 
nothing else needs to be done, the reform business can be continued. The other drugs which can cause features like Gilbert syndrome are the antiretroviral drugs like atazanavir and indinavir. Similarly, irinity can in the chemotherapeutic drugs which is used for third line chemotherapy for colorectal cancer can give the same effect. So if a patient is on these drugs and if you have mild elevation of indirect bilirubin, please do not worry, reassure and you can continue the drug. There is no need to discontinue the drug for this indication. What do we get clinically to say that this is indirect hyperbilirubinemia even before the reports arise? Look at the urine color. Whenever there is unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, the urine color will remain normal. If you have a dark urine, a high colored urine, then it is not unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So this is something which should be borne in mind. A simple investigation is looking at the bilirubin, whether it is conjugated or unconjugated. For this you require dry biochemistry and you must look at conjugation and not direct and indirect bilirubin because if you expose the blood sample to sunlight, you convert the insoluble bilirubin to soluble bilirubin and therefore when you test by Wernerberg reaction, you falsely measure a high direct bilirubin. <coughs> so you have to insist to the lab in such cases to do a conjugated bilirubin by dry biochemistry, not by Wernerberg reaction. So do not look for direct and indirect because that is a measure of solubility which changes with exposure to sunlight. Sounds difficult. Can we make it easier? Yes. A much easier test. Send the urine for biopigments. We discussed only conjugated bilirubin comes in the urine. So you test the urine. If it shows biopigments, that means there is conjugated bilirubin present in the urine. So it has to be high in the blood. If you have a patient who has got a high bilirubin, but urine biopigments are absent, then this patient has unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. You can be again rest assured that the liver is working fine in this patient. What happens when a patient who has got a cirrhosis presents with, in, develops a hemolytic anemia or reabsorption of hematoma? In these patients, in the, although the jaundice is because of the hemolysis, you will almost always get mixed hyperbilirubinemia. So, if you have hemolysis, but what is happening is elevation of both direct and indirect fractions, then you must suspect that there could be an underlying cirrhosis or a chronic liver disease. How do you approach a patient who has come to you with jaundice, the viral markers are negative and the patient denies history of alcohol. You have to ask for seven P's in your history. Prodromal symptoms. Remember, if there are prodromal symptoms, then it is still viral hepatitis, although the tests are negative. We know that the tests for hepatitis A and E can be negative in up to 20% of the patients who actually have the disease. So IgM HAV and IgM HEV have a false negativity rate of 20%. Pruritus is the second thing, which indicates cholestasis. Now, once you know that there is cholestasis, your differential diagnosis shifts from hepatocellular disease to a cholestatic disease. Third is past history of recurrent jaundice. So there are different causes where you get recurrent episodes of jaundice. Previous medication is the fourth P. Always remember to take a detailed drug history. Usually you ask the patient to take out all the drugs. Obviously all of you are busy practitioners, none of you have the time. But you can ask your nurse or a ward attendant to write down the names of the drugs that the patient is taking. Take history of past surgeries or past interventions and prior or current hepatic decompensation. And last but not the least, the seventh P is persistent prodromal symptoms. Normally, once the, the jaundice starts and few days into jaundice, in the acute viral hepatitis, the prodromal symptoms will disappear. The fever will go away, the nausea will go away, the vomiting will stop, the bilirubin will continue to rise. If you have a patient 15 days, 20 days into jaundice, 
still having anorexia, still having fever, still having vomiting, this is not acute viral hepatitis. This is something more. Either you are dealing with a non-hepatotropic virus, like a cytomegalovirus or a EBV, or you are dealing with an infiltrated liver disorder. It could be a leukemia, it could be a lymphoma, it could be a mass, that is macrophage activating syndrome, but it is not acute viral hepatitis. It could be disseminated TB, but it is not a usual acute viral hepatitis. So usually one to two weeks into the jaundice, you should expect the prodromal symptoms to disappear in a patient with acute viral hepatitis. On medical history, what are the hints that we get? Past episodes of jaundice. Very limited differential diagnosis when you have multiple episodes of jaundice. Either you are dealing with a genetic disorder which causes repeated jaundice like a brick, PFIC or Gilbert's or you are dealing with autoimmune hepatitis, you are dealing with Wilson's disease, hepatitis B, all these diseases. Ask for history of alcohol again, although the initial history is negative, always ask this history when the patient is alone and especially we tend to forget to take this history in women and today if you ask me in my practice the proportion of patients with alcoholic cirrhosis that I see is almost 30% women it was almost 95% men and 5% women 10 years ago today alcoholic cirrhosis in my practice is 30% women and 70% men so remember to take this history and take this history when the patient is alone. Do not take this history in front of the family. A wonderful paper, in fact, by Yates in 1998, showed that if you ask the partner or the spouse about the quantity of alcohol intake, they actually under-report it even more than the patient himself. So do not rely on the history given by the partner or the spouse they will under report it. So it has to come from the patient. He is the most likely to come close to the truth even though even that may be one fourth of the actual quantity. <laughs> Take the history of medications in a detailed manner. Prescription medicines, non-prescription medicines, complementary and alternative medicines. Very frequently people do not count complementary medicines as medicines and they will not tell you unless you specifically dig into it. Persistent trauma symptoms we have already discussed. What about past surgical history? If you have a history of recent cholecystectomy, you know that it is a surgical problem unless specified otherwise. If it's a old gallbladder surgery, maybe one year ago, two years ago, then it's a biliary stricture. If it's a Kasai surgery done in the childhood, very likely, that there is a recurrence of the disease or an astomosic stricture. If you have a history of instrumentation to the biliary system, like an ERCP done for cholangitis or during surgery, uh, some intervention was required, a T-tube was placed, then again probably you are dealing with the biliary stricture. Can we get any clues on physical examination? Hepatomegaly. In any acute jaundice, you can have hepatomegaly. But look for two things. One, is it tender? If it is a tender hepatomegaly, you are dealing with either a congested liver, which can happen in butt carry syndrome, constructive pericarditis, or congestive cardiac failure, or a liver abscess. Or, the so second thing which you should look for is a very hard liver, which is usually an infiltrated liver because of a malignancy. So, these are the two things on hepatomegaly absence of a hepatomegaly is even more specific. So if you have a patient with acute jaundice and you cannot palpate a liver, means you are dealing with an advanced liver disease, it's a cirrhotic shrunken liver and that's why it is not palpable. A palpable gallbladder indicates that there is obstructive jaundice, surgical jaundice under specified other. <coughs> to look for signs of liver cell failure, whether it is because of acute liver failure or decompensated cirrhosis, of course you can differentiate based on which signs are present. Features of cholestasis, you can get scratch marks, excoriations, xanthelasmas and xanthomas. Again, 
for acute cholestatic event you will get scratch marks but you get xanthelasmas or xanthomas in patients with chronic cholestatic liver disorders which could be drug induced psc or primary biliary cirrhosis so once you have taken this history you should be able to differentiate between a hepatocellular jaundice and a cholestatic jaundice and in the cholestatic jaundice you should be able to differentiate whether the disease is outside the liver that is extra hepatic or it is within the liver that is intra hepatic so in hepatocellular jaundice what are the common causes that you should always think of first is viral hepatitis including the occult hepatotropic so you have done your igm hiv hiv hepatitis b hbsg and tnc what else are the markers which can be present so it could still be hep a and hep b and your markers are negative in such cases you may have to do hiv rna or hiv rna which is done more in the stools not in the blood and then you have to of course send the sample to nib pune and they can do it free of cost for you or you could be dealing with upper hep b or acute hep b in which case hbsg may be negative so in such cases you would always send an igm anticore antibody because that is the marker which is positive during the window period the non hematotrophic viruses is the next group cytomegalovirus virus epstein barr virus and herpes simplex virus three common hanta virus and rickets cell fever are the two other rare disorders of this can you get any specific clues when you have a patient yes if a patient has a very high enzymes 7000 8000 10000 as gd as gpd but bilirubin is only 2 3 4 it is herpes simplex unless specified otherwise remember even in those patients who have herpes simplex once they develop liver failure even with treatment the mortality is more than 80% and therefore you should be able to pick up herpes simplex hepatitis before they develop liver failure only then you can prevent mortality otherwise even if you do transplant for them they will still develop secondary changes in the brain they will develop brain hemorrhages and then even if you do transplant you will still lose those patients so herpes hepatitis should be diagnosed before they develop liver failure so have a very high index of suspicion when you have very high enzymes and minimal elevation of bilirubin autoimmune hepatitis is the other cause where we would typically send ana asma igg levels and if required other autoimmune markers isolated ana positivity does not mean autoimmune hepatitis so autoimmune hepatitis is diagnosed based on clinical presentation autoimmune markers and histology do not diagnose a patient with autoimmune hepatitis based on ana positivity alone or elevated igg levels because they can be elevated in anybody with any acute jaundice even with viral hepatitis so be very careful when you diagnose autoimmune hepatitis you may actually cause harm to some of these patients if you give them empirical steroids and you are dealing with some other pathology drugs very common we are all aware of the drugs which can cause some drugs which we tend to miss i want to highlight one is clofazimine today i see at least one patient every 3 months with clofazimine hepatitis the another drug which is commonly used is isotretinoin that can also cause acute hepatitis fluoroquinolones is the third group so remember these three drugs which can cause acute hepatitis and we do not usually associate uh, the jaundice with these drugs amongst the called complementary and alternative medicines we are all aware of tenospora giloy there are papers now where we have seen patients coming with acute hepatitis because of this do not forget butcher syndrome wilson's disease and in pregnant women aflp and preeclampsia I am not going into the details of intrahepatic cholestasis, but just an approach. If you find isolated GGT elevation in a patient with high bilirubin, it could be because of alcohol, or in the absence of alcohol, it could be because of early infiltrative liver disease. Normal SGT as GPT, but high GGT. Suspect a disseminated infection, TB, fungal, or 
infertility disease like sarcoidosis or tuberculosis. Remember the cutoff values of alkaline phosphate and GGT and the first step is to differentiate whether we are dealing with extrahepatic or intrahepatic cholestasis. And if you see all the symptoms can be produced by both intrahepatic causes as well as extrahepatic causes. The only thing that can differentiate between the two is one presence of biliary pain which will be only in extrahepatic obstruction and features of cholangitis which will be present only if there are extrahepatic uh, obstruction. Otherwise you will not get uh, any clinical clue to differentiate between intrahepatic and extrahepatic. Itching, uh, clay colored stools, deep jaundice, high alkaline phosphatase, GGT can be produced by both the disorders. We can divide our causes of intrahepatic cholestasis because where we have impaired excretion of the bile from the canaliculus or compression of the smaller bile ducts within the liver. And you'll get a huge list of disorders. Of course, we don't have time to go through all of these, but I would emphasize on some of these. Paraneoplastic, something which we tend to forget. A paraneoplastic syndrome can produce intrahepatic cholestasis. So if you have a patient who has come with jaundice, systemic symptoms, but you are not finding any liver pathology, please look for a malignancy elsewhere. That is something which we tend to miss. Another one is IgG4 cholangiopathy. Sometimes it can be isolated intrahepatic IgG4 cholangiopathy. So whenever you suspect PSC, you must also suspect IgG4, especially in people who have got other autoimmune disorders. And always send the biopsy for IgG4 staining. This is something which we have studied from, from first MBBS and I am not going to spend time but those who have got a bilirubin up to 7 with normal SGOT, SGPT, with normal alkalines and phosphatase and GGT, it is Dubin-Johnson syndrome unless specified otherwise or rotor syndrome. Those who have got high bilirubin, recurrent episodes of pruritus starting from early childhood and reaching up to adulthood you are dealing with a familial cholestatic disorder like a BRIC or a PFIC disorder. So to summarize my dear friends, this is how I would approach a patient with jaundice. The first thing is based on history and basic investigations whether we have only elevated bilirubin. If we have only elevation of bilirubin, you see whether it is indirect or direct that is unconjugated or conjugated. If it is unconjugated whether it is drugs, inherited disorders or hemolysis. If it is direct, whether it is inherited disorder or an infiltrative disorder. If you find that along with bilirubin, other tests are elevated, whether they are hepatocellular or cholestatic. If they are hepatocellular, look for occult virus or non hepatotrophic virus, toxicity and autoimmune hepatitis, Wilson's disease. If they are negative, look for rare disorders. If you still don't find, do a liver biopsy. Cholestatic pattern. Do an ultrasound to see if there is an obstruction, find an obstruction, do a CT, MRCP or ESCP depending on what you find. If on ultrasound you do not find an obstruction, look for serology for viral hepatitis. You can do AMA if they are negative, do an MRCP and liver biopsy uh, or liver biopsy and if you find any of this positive then you can do a liver biopsy to confirm your diagnosis. Thank you very much and this is my department in uh, the new hospital where I have joined which is the Sir Reliance, Sir HM Reliance Foundation Hospital. Uh, we are fortunate to have international consultants like Professor Dominic Wala, we have a liver intensivist and I have two more hepatologists working with me. So I invite all of you to visit us, you will enjoy the hospital, it's the state of the art, there is every single facility that is that is possible anywhere in the world is available at this facility. At very, very affordable prices. Thank you very much for a patient care. Dr. Sikla sir, and I think the topic is well covered and clear also. Uh, any questions from the audience? Sir, I have a question. Uh, in a significant group of patients in which the clinic clinical profile match with uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, particularly in a NASH group of patients, when biochemical parameters suggest there is a significant inflammation. 
and in the similar patients, it has been observed and some data suggests that simultaneously there is a significant elevation of autoimmune markers, particularly AN and in asthma also. And even histologically, the picture is not very clear. Sometimes the histological profile also shows the features of, uh, I mean to say like uh, fat, fatty changes, or microvesicles and all. Simultaneously some confusing but still significant picture of autoimmune hepatitis. So what should we approach in such type of patients? Uh, thank you very much. I think it's a very practical and relevant question. So, when you have a biopsy for a patient who is suspected to have either NASH or autoimmune hepatitis, to diagnose NASH, only seeing statosis is not adequate. You need to have three features. So, unless you have all these three features, you cannot diagnose NASH. In addition, you will get that bladder generated nuclei in the hepatocytes. So, that is when you will say that this patient has NASH. For autoimmune hepatitis, although we, we have too much on interface hepatitis, it is actually not specific. What you need to see is empiripolysis, infiltration with plasma cells, and again lobular inflammation. So if you see carefully, the only common feature is lobular inflammation. But if you look at the, cell, the, the density of the inflammation, in NASH, it is always sparse inflammation, whereas in autoimmune hepatitis, it is always very dense inflammation. And if you look at the cells carefully, in autoimmune hepatitis, you will find predominantly lymphocytes and plasma cells, whereas in NASH, you will find polymorphs, you will find some eosinophils, and of course, you will still have a large quantity of lymphocytes, but plasma cells will almost never be there. So that is how you can make a differentiation. You can have steatosis, and this patient may still develop autoimmune hepatitis. So only fat cells does not mean that we are dealing with NASH. Uh, I want to some, say some practical uh, issue regarding the Gilbert syndrome. As we know, it is nothing to do with the, in long term morbidity. But patient always say he has fatigue, he has some nausea, or he has some multiple sort of the, uh, problem. Day. How to deal with it? I think again a very practical question. The patient feels that it is because of the liver. Whereas you know that it is not because of the Gilbert syndrome. So, here I think the effort is to find out, rather than saying it is not because of the liver, our endeavor is to find out why it is there. Because there has to be some other reason for this patient to develop nausea or dyspepsia. So, we would put our efforts to finding that cause and that is when we can tell the patient this is the reason and not the liver. It is very difficult when the patient actually starts feeling the nausea or right upper quadrant discomfort once he knows that there is Gilbert syndrome. Yeah. There, Actually, you have to go back to the history and ask them, when did you start getting the symptoms? And that is what actually solves the problem. You have to have just reassurance. And I think once you are confident yourself, you can give the reassurance to the patient. It is when we ourselves are not confident, that is when we fail to transmit the confidence to the patient. Definitely. And any role for phenobarbitone to getting down the bilirubin in there? So, we can do give multiple drugs which can bring down the bilirubin, but again, you don't need to. So, usually I would never use any drug to bring down the bilirubin. What you can tell the patient to reassure them is, if you start eating well, your bilirubin levels will be under control. What I tell to my patient is, for everybody else, one bilirubin is normal, for you, a bilirubin of five is normal. And that is what reassures most of the people. It is giving example that if somebody is six feet two inches, he is not abnormal. Although everybody in the society is five feet six inches. Just because somebody is 6 feet 2 inches, he is actually taller. So I tell them that you should be proud that your balloon is slightly higher than the rest. <laughs> and then they become very happy. To uh, do liver biopsy in those patients whose uh, serological workup and routine workup is uh, negative. And what are the usual findings you come across? I actually have a low threshold for doing biopsy. I do liver biopsies very frequently. Uh, and I can tell you, at least in 70 to 80 percent of the cases, doing a liver biopsy has changed my diagnosis. Very often, we went in thinking that this is severe alcoholic hepatitis and the patient turned out to be autoimmune hepatitis. Just because the person was drinking heavy amounts of alcohol, we were all thinking this is alcoholic hepatitis. We did a biopsy, we found that it was autoimmune, responded beautifully to steroids. We went in once thinking it is autoimmune hepatitis and we found a leukemia. So, you will get every one in three patients or one in four patients which will be completely surprising. 
So do not hesitate to do liver biopsy in patients where you are unable to find a cause. But this finding a cause has to be very diligent clinically and based on serum investigation. Because I think by careful history and investigations, you will be able to find the cause in at least 80 to 90% of the cases. Maybe in 10% you will not find a cause. Thank you.